Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the December edition of Molten Music Monthly. You join us here on the day after winter solstice and yet the sun is still just about flickering over the tops of the houses to remind us that summer is on the way. Oh yes. With just a couple of days to go to Christmas, what could I possibly have to talk about that doesn't involve Brussels sprouts and stuffing and turkey and bread sauce? Well, this month we touch a little bit on Yeko again. We discover how to create the ultimate synth workstation in Gig Performer. You can build your own MIDI controller with mine. I have a look at the only synth you are ever going to need with Vengeance Avenger. Cubase reaches version 9 and borrows some really cool features. We get our glitch on with Time Shifter. Tim XL throws us five years worth of loops in an amazing flow type instrument. We also have the latest Molten modular news and a couple of my favourite things of the year because, well, let's face it, 2016 has been a disaster of a year. And so I had to pull some fun out of there somewhere. Just a quick one on Yeko. I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to bang on about it, but I've just finished a full review of Yeko, which you can find in my YouTube channel. Yeko is a multi-touch controller for Ableton Live, and it transforms Live into a completely multi-touch, performable, gigable environment. But what I forgot to do in the review is tell you that they've given me a special code to get you a 50% discount. So Yeko is only 45 euros. If you fancy picking it up for half of that, then at the checkout, all you've got to do is put in the word Molten Music, all in capitals, all one word, and you will get half off. That's not bad. This is running until the end of the year to the end of December. So get in there now. Even if you don't have a touchscreen, it's worth picking it up just in case you might in the future. It's a great piece of software. Go and check out the review. Go and get your copy half price and everything will be super lovely. I think this is one of the finds of the year. Gig Performer is a VST host. It hosts your VST instruments and your VST effects lets you chain them all together in a kind of a modular, wonderful way so that you can perform with what would become the most ultimate synth and effects box for your gig. So you drop in different instruments, you can layer them across your MIDI keyboard and play them in different layers. You can have audio running through it, through your sound card, through different plug-in effects, all at the same time, all through the same environment. But what makes it interesting is the fact that you can create a customized control panel for whatever synths and effects you've got loaded. So you don't need to bring up the entire GUI. You can just choose a few controls and build a rack-like interface in order to control them. But what really interests me is the fact that this rack interface is completely multi-touchable, which is right up my alley. I love that sort of thing. So for whatever crappy synth you've got that's completely untouchable, you can create a fully multi-touchable control panel for it in this rack kind of layout. It's great, you can choose from different knobs and different sliders and slap them all on and then MIDI learn to whatever parameter you want on your synth. So the result of all of this is that if you're a gigging musician who likes to use software synths, you can set them all up, slap them all the way across your keyboard, and then just have your tablet or surface right there to make adjustments on whatever you want as you're playing without having to grab a mouse, without having to drop to laptop stance. It's all there. You create your customized control panel and you're away. I've made a little demo video of it again in this YouTube channel, so go and check that out. It's really an awesome piece of software. Why have a fixed hardware controller when you can have a tray that you can fill up with all sorts of different controllers? That's kind of the concept behind mine, which is a weird word for a fully customizable hardware MIDI controller. You get this lovely sort of eight by eight wood paneled tray and then lots of little blocks that you put in, pads, rotary encoders, faders, cross faders, and you put them in in any configuration you like, a bit like some kind of music technology Lego. And then there you are, there's your hardware controller. So if you want eight by eight pads, you can have that. If you want four by eight and then a bunch of faders, you can have that. If you want a load of buttons and a fader and a, something else and something else, you can have that. It's entirely 
up to you. It's a really cool idea. I mean, in many ways, that's what attracts me to uh, multi-touch and touchscreen technology is that you have an infinitely customizable control surface. But the thing is with this MIME thing is there are lots of hardware controllers out there already in many of the common configurations you're going to use. And I wonder, the more I think about it, is how much customization I really need. I mean, actually, if I've got a launch pad, which is eight by eight pads, do I really want more than that? Perhaps, well, then there's a, an Akai controller or something like that, which has got faders and pads on it that would probably do the job. Am I likely to create something really weird and way out with mine? I don't know. Also, 8x8 is not a great deal of room. So perhaps it would be more interesting if it was, if it was bigger, if you had 24 by 24 some huge array of things where you could create, but then it would become unwieldy. I don't know. I mean, it's still a really cool idea. I just don't know actually in the reality, in the cold, hard reality of it, how useful it's actually going to be. And are you going to start losing those blocks? And how much is it anyway? I mean, it could be hundreds of pounds. We don't know yet. So, you know, for sort of 50 to 100 pounds, you can pick up a hardware MIDI controller of all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So if it's going to be hundreds of pounds, then is that going to be worth it? And are you going to have to buy lots more extra packs of faders and packs of pads, depending on what you're going to, oh, I'm not sure. As I say, great idea. They're about to launch it on Kickstarter. So it's something which is not even available yet. And there's no pricing, but in the new year, it'll be on Kickstarter and we can check it out, but it looks awesome. It looks beautiful. Great idea. I just don't know whether it's a goer. Now, I love a bit of self-belief and Vengeance seem to have it in absolute bucketfuls. The Avenger synth is apparently the only synth you are ever going to need. They called it the Alpha and Omega of software synthesis. Wow, well, you know, it has eight oscillators, which can be anything of seven different forms of synthesis. You can draw your own waveforms, you can morph through wavetables, you can drop in samples, resample grain and stuff it and whop it and in here and whop it back in again. You can then set up uh, banks and banks of filters and LFOs and then route LFOs to this bit, to that bit, to this bit and create another tab of that to another oscillator and then route that back in to create the most overwhelmingly enormous sound you could possibly imagine. They say that that mystical group of top producers and sound designers have provided over 900 presets for the instrument. And apparently it covers all genres, provided that it's electronic and EDM. It doesn't sound very alpha-y or omega-y to me, but what do I know? But anyway, it's an immense synth that's packed to the gills with sound and modulation possibilities. I think personally that I would get completely lost. I would have no idea what was modulating what to where. I mean, it could probably create these enormous soundscapes, but how in control of that sound would I be? How much of it would I actually know? Or am I just going to be click, 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 clicking through those presets going nah, 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 ooh, nah, nah. I don't know. I just don't think that's my bag anymore, man. But I think if you're into massive workstation synths, then something like Vengeance Avenger is probably right up your street. But for me, I kind of like things simpler, more minimalist. Somehow you need, I believe you need to have more control over what you are intending to do so that your music becomes intentional. I'm going to root this oscillator to here. I'm going to modulate it with this to create this kind of sound. I believe we need to be more restrictive and simpler on the tools that we use to make music. Otherwise, we just end up with these enormous sounding masses of soundscapes. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but if you're into that, that's awesome. But yeah, I don't think it's for me. Steinberg promised Cubase 9 by Christmas and they delivered. They also promised to fix a load of stuff and to stuff in things that people ask for and they pretty much delivered on that too. The most requested feature was some kind of undo in the mixer environment, in the mixer console. And they did more than that. They've put in an entire history and it's pretty amazing. Actually, maybe I've just never come across it before. I don't know, I can't think where I have. But anyway, anything you do in the mixer console, any fader movement, any drop of effects, any EQ, any movement of any parameter within that is logged in a history which appears down the left hand side. And then all you have to do is click 
on your past, which is in this history, and it will take it back there. It will unload effects for you or plug them back in as you move forwards and backwards through your history. It's extraordinary. It's one of those things that's so phenomenally useful that you'll quickly forget that it wasn't there before because you'll be using it all the time completely naturally. Just checking back, forwards, back, forwards, going back a few steps. Or, I mean, I often completely lose where the mixer is at all, and which is the second thing that they fixed, which is the floating windows rigmarole. Because windows appear all over the place in Cubase, and you can have everything open all at once, all cascaded on top of each other. Uh, I'm never really quite sure what I'm looking at half the time. So what they've done is they've invented this awesome idea of having this kind of lower zone. So in the lower part of the screen, they're going to dock the mixer. Well, they have docked the mixer. And it's just down there. I mean, what a phenomenal idea. I mean, if only people like Studio One or Sonar had thought of that before, or perhaps had they? But anyway, we're not going to dwell on that. So you can now dock the mixer at the bottom, and it also becomes an area where the editors happen. So if we double click on the MIDI clip, the MIDI editor appears at the bottom, or the audio editor appears at the bottom. That kind of thing. It's great. It really calms the whole lot down. So you're no longer trying to find which window you're on, trying to dabbing at function keys to bring the right sort of window up. It's now down there at the bottom and it changed dynamically depending on what you're doing. It's great. It works. We know that it works well and it's great that Steinberg have adopted it. The other thing that's in there that apparently was asked for by the community is a simple sampler and it's pretty ace. I mean, most sampling software is overly complex. When you look at something like Contact, it's such a job to layer up and import samples and layer them and velocity map them. And then there's all sorts of dynamics and all this stuff going on. When actually all you want is to pull out a piece of audio, slap it on your keyboard and go blah, 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 Kind of thing. Well, at least I do. The great thing about the sampler track in Cubase is you can drag in audio from anywhere. You drag it off your desktop, drag it out of the media bay, out of the browser. You can even take it straight off a track. So you want to pull something out of a track, just highlight it, pull it out, slap it in a mixer track, and it's there. And then you can choose start and stop points and loop points, all that stuff, simple stuff. So it's bam, it's there. You're playing it on your keyboard. It's instant and enjoyable. And it kind of reminds you why sampling was really cool back back in the day when you're using hardware samplers and stuff like that. Because it was. It's got horribly complex these days. And it's such a joy to use something which is just simple. I guess, you know, it's like the simpler in Ableton, uh, a very similar idea. But Steinberg have decided to steal things from good places. And I don't think there's a problem with that. Uh, personally, anything that's good out there, every manufacturer should be unashamedly stealing and sticking in their own software. That's what I think. That way we all benefit got to be good. I've also done a video overview of Cubase 9 running on the Surface Book, so check that out in the channel. There's loads of stuff in our YouTube channel. It's packed full of fascinating stuff. You should go and check it out. This is a very interesting plugin from Cable Guys. It messes with the time-space continuum. You take a bit of audio, slap it in, and then you can zoom around in time forwards backwards you can do sort of tape stops and stutter effects glitching you can do drum replacement bits because you've gone backwards in time to that bit to this bit uh, sort of pitch shifting modulating time based stuff it's a lot of fun to play with it's very much like gross beat from image line i don't know if you've seen that before but it's a plugin that comes with fl studio and it, again it sets up these great stuttery type rhythmic uh, effects and stops and stuff. But Time Shaper seems to go to a lot more detail and gives you a lot more control over what the heck is going on. You can draw in the time, the way you want it to move, the way you want it to interact across bars and pitch and, and stuff. It's very interesting. The particularly good bit is that you can send it back in time so your loop is running and rather than playing a second snare it'll play the snare that happened before or it'll play the kick that happened before so it'll jump along then jump back and jump over here and jump over here it's a really interesting way to mess with your audio it also has this multi-band functionality where you can affect the high frequencies mid frequencies and low frequencies differently so you can have like the low frequency is going forward, the high frequency is going backwards, or the middle frequency is going jump over here, jump over here, jump over here, back here, slow, fast. You know, crazy stuff. It's an awesome bit of software. 
I mean, I'm never entirely sure how useful glitchy plugins are in the reality of trying to craft a song or a piece of music, but it's a hell of a lot of fun to play with, and you are bound to find a use for it somewhere, and it's only 39 euros to buy. So, you know, download the demo, go and give it a go. Tim XR is a master of Reactor. His latest release is called Flow, and it contains five years worth of sampled loops that he's created on his own crazy bonkers hardware software flow machine thing that he uses when he's gigging. It lets you mix and morph together four different loops and then you can dial through the years, the months and the days to choose different loops to throw into that. There's a bunch of effects and modulation and weirdness going on and you can entertain yourself for hours just by clicking things and pressing things and moving things about. You can also just sort of press play and let it evolve itself over time. Tim calls it an algorithmic loop sequencer. And that's kind of what it is, although you can't put your own material into it. So rather than being kind of an instrument, it's more of an art installation. It's more that uh, Tim has all these loops he doesn't know what to do with, and so he stuffed them into this en engine that mixes the whole lot together to create quite a, an awesome experimental soundscape. I mean, it sounds awesome, and it's also a brilliant, if not genius, way to release new material. And on top of all that, it's completely free. So not really what I was thinking there. <laughs> but that's great. So go and download it, and it's yours, and you can play with it, and you can use it completely royalty-free in your own music, if you so wish. So where are we with Molten Modular? Well, I did a video on the plan, sort of explaining what the heck it is I think I'm doing and trying to do. So that's out there again in the channel, so go and check that out. And so the next step is I'm just working now on a video on semi-modular, because going all the way to modular is too big a step. It's too far to go. You're not going to get there, not in one leap. There has to be some steps along the way. And that first step, I believe, is semi-modular synthesis. So I'm working on that at the moment, looking at semi-modular synths as a gateway to modular synthesizers. Because if you can't handle a semi-modular, then there's no way you're gonna handle a proper modular synth. And it's a good way of getting into it because it gives you a fully functional synthesizer that you can use whether you decide to pursue modular or not. So I'm right in the middle of that and I'm probably gonna have that out in the new year sometime. And then I'm gonna follow that up talking about software alternatives as well. Something like SoftTube Modular is a great way to work out whether Modular is actually for you. Because if you just have some basic components, uh, an oscillator, filter, envelope, amplifier, that kind of thing, the sounds you get out are not necessarily that inspiring. And I think spending time with SoftTube Modular will probably shock a lot of people out of this whole Eurorack modular synthesis idea. and and dream if you like because what we're after is extraordinary sounds and actually with the basic building blocks you get basic sounds and it's important to understand that that it's going to take work it's going to take extra modules it's going to take real exploration to take uh, a simple oscillator to this amazing beeping glitching music making level that we're after hmm. so yeah i'm still putting in a lot of thought I'm still getting there step by step, but the next thing will be semi-modular. We'll look at that next year and see how we go. 2016 has been an awful year. I mean, the amount of creative people who have died this year, the wars, the terrorism, the awful political decisions that have been made the world over, it's just bonkers. So I thought I really better find something in this year to worth going yay about. And I found a couple of things. First of all, Yeko. I've spoken about it a lot now, and I think that I would like to stamp it with my best bit of software of 2016 stamp. If I had a stamp, I would stamp it, but I don't, so I'm just gonna say that I think uh, it's a superb piece of software. It's not perfect. I've had my odd bit of trouble with it along the way, but to find a piece of software that you open up and it instantly transforms your working environment. I've never come across something which works so well, so instantly, and is so ultimately useful to what I'm doing. I mean, so often a new bit of software comes along and you sort of go, yeah, all right, that's okay. How can I best use this? How can I work around 
the limitations and get really to the nub of what I'm trying to use it for. Yeko wasn't like that. Yeko just came along and went, bam, here you go, a completely new way of looking at Ableton Live. Is that all right? And you go, yeah, that's flipping awesome. I'll have that. Thank you very much. Doesn't happen very often. So thank you for that, Yekko. And remember, you can get it for half price if you use the code Molten Music at checkout. The other most interesting product for me this year was the Zero Coast from Make Noise. It's a little semi-modular synth. Uh, I ran into one at the Synth Fest in the summer and just got to have a little play and just fell in love with it straight away. It has weird lights, it has words on it that I don't understand, it has a routing situation that I haven't got a clue what's going on and knobs that I'm not sure what they're doing. But as you play with it, it makes these beeps and these sounds come out and they keep coming out and you just keep just, just gets better and better. And wow, what is that? What does this do? It's like I don't know, it's like playing blind, I suppose, but it's more than that because it's, it's, it's visual as well as physical and the sound, the look, the movement, the noise, the jib, the It's a great little synth. It's a great little synth for anybody, whether you're interested in modular or not, it has all these patch points where you can patch its craziness out to other things. And that in itself is awesome, but on its own, it just makes this noise that I'd not come across before. It's fabulous. It's called the Zero Coast or the O Coast sometimes because people mistake that zero at the front for an O and that's okay. We don't care. And it's by a company called Make Noise in America. The idea is that it combines both East Coast and West Coast styles of synthesis and I don't have any idea what that means either. And I don't really care but I hope these are the sorts of things I'm going to learn all about in Molten Modular. So there you are. I have no idea what's going on with that box but it makes me smile every time I use it. And this year that's really what I've needed. 2016 is also the year that the Surface Pro 4 didn't really work as well as expected. I did all of my big mega test software and performance tests on it, and some things were okay, some things really weren't. And so that's kind of been immensely frustrating. Although I've persevered and persevered, and right about now it's starting to pay dividends. There have been a lot of updates from Microsoft, both in terms of Windows 10 and in terms of firmware for the Surface Pro 4. And also at the moment, I have a Surface book on loan from Microsoft as well. And my recent testing has been far more encouraging. I've done a video very recently on Ableton Live and the performance testing and that, and the results were actually excellent. Excellent both on the Surface book and on the Surface Pro 4. And I made an interesting comparison between the two because the, the book's an i7 and the Pro 4 is an i5. So as we're nearing the end of 2016 and looking forward to perhaps the Surface Pro 5 and the Surface Book 2, it looks like Microsoft really listened and understood where the problems lie, perhaps, and worked hard to resolve them. Maybe not. Maybe it's all been accidental. Maybe the improvements that they've made have been to other systems and that's just by accident helped out what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is get CPU power to the audio streams in and out of the system and that has improved tremendously. I'm going to do a lot more testing. I've still got the service book for a few more weeks and I'm going to do a lot more software testing just to see what else is working really well. So thank Fudge for that and you can check out my latest testing on surfaceproaudio.com. So that's about it. Last year I gave you some really interesting patronizing production tips. This year I don't know, I think there's, if, if there's one thing that I could offer up as a, as a challenge to myself and maybe to you, and that's to back away from the presets, to make music intentionally, to craft sounds on purpose, to start with a minimal amount of gear, just a selection of plugins and synths, and make do with that, learn how they interact and do things yourself to create your own sound. Let the sound generation be part of your creativity rather than using the creativity of someone else in that bank of a thousand presets. So that's my challenge for 2017. Keep it simple, keep it deliberate, and let's see where we are next year. Probably the same place. Well, thanks for watching. And if you enjoy these videos, if you enjoy what I do and what I present on this channel, then please share it around, stick it in your social feeds, tell people about it, retweet it, Facebook it out there, Instagram, whatever would be great. I would love to reach a wider audience and get this stuff 
out there further so that more people can enjoy my face. Oh, well, I mean, at least can perhaps be helped by what I'm talking about. Because ultimately, I just want all this stuff to be helpful. So have a great Christmas, have a fascinating new year. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. Thank you.